<laughs> Hello, everybody. This is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Welcome to this Fellowship Friday for the Church of the Eternally Secure. Woo! I'm so happy to be with everybody tonight. I know everybody else is happy to be here. Whoa, let me let me celebrate. I'm jumping for joy. What do you think of my shirt here? You see this? I used to wear this shirt when I was out street preaching. And uh, that's kind of what we're going to be talking about tonight is uh, what I will call truisms. Uh, truism is uh, something that's uh, a very profound truth that's stated only on, in a few words. That's how I'm defining it. And at least I'm, I'm giving it that definition. Uh, so uh, I've been accumulating these truisms now for probably five or six months. I've been asking people to send them in, whatever you, you think would uh, qualify. It has to be short. And it has to be easy to understand. And it has to be a profound truth about the gospel. And uh, we, we co I've collected about 30 of them. There were some I had to discard because they were a little too long and convoluted. Uh, so um, we're going to go over those t uh, tonight and probably next Friday. It's going to take a while to get through all of them, but uh, it gives us a, a subject and I'm real eager to to do this. Uh, so before we get started on that, though, I want everybody to introduce themselves and say hi. And I'm going to, I'm looking at you on the bottom of my screen from left to right. I have uh, Paula, Bible literalist. I got Brother Dave, uh, got Jesus. Uh, I got Sister Lisa, believe on the Lord is what I'm seeing. I see Matthias back here be hiding behind the, the curtain, uh, behind uh, the veil, or the, it's kind of like the wizard operating behind the scenes, but he's all powerful. He's the producer. And I'm expecting Renee is going to join us tonight. She texted me and says she's running about 15 minutes late. So Renee should be here in just a few minutes. Okay, so let's uh, let's do these introductions, starting from my left to right here. We got uh, Sister Paula, Bible literalist. Uh, in case someone doesn't know you, tell them who you are and what you do on YouTube. Yeah, Bible Literalist pretty well describes my channel. That um, I mostly do Bible studies, uh, some topical, some book studies, and some conspiratorial things, not a lot of it, and uh, some DIY. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I definitely subscribe to uh, uh, Bible Literalist. You'll find a lot of very interesting content on her channel. She has a great depth of knowledge about the scriptures. And uh, especially, I like the way that she uses the Greek. It's a, it's a, um, it's a way of um, looking at the scriptures that I, I've never done over the years. And I'm glad that she is uh, bringing that to the congregation. Uh, and next, we have Sister Lisa. Sister Lisa, will you tell them about your channel, please. Praise the Lord, beloved of the Most High God. I, uh, my channel is for the most high jesus that's the number four the most high jesus uh, i like to talk to people about you know any misnomers that i find that maybe the body of christ has fallen prey to with regard to false doctrine or uh, people misleading people according to the scriptures i'll speak on it and also um, i've started uploading content that i think is important to the body of christ to know uh, so sometimes you might see some other things from other channels um, that i upload with permission that i think are very important and very very relative for you to learn about all right thank you sister and if you haven't already her channel uh, is four the, the number four uh, for the most high Jesus <clears throat> subscribe to her and you will not be disappointed in her content I uh, somehow I skipped right over got Jesus uh, brother Dave your turn I don't know if you're talking Dave but we can't hear you you're muted so if you hey what's up brother Luke how y'all doing uh, glad to be here got a Channel by the name of Brother Dave, just post encouragement videos, some Bible teachings, going to be doing some different things myself. Um, just happy to be here. I love fellowship uh, with the body of Christ and the community of grace believers and uh, those who are new, you know, welcome. Um, we're glad to have you. And uh, I look forward to tonight and listening to what the panel has to say. Sister Paula, Sister Lisa, Brother Luke, Sister Renee, as she joins later and Brother Matthias. And it's just uh, 
you know, it's just good to be here. It's been a long week and, uh, you know, it's always good to fellowship and, and be around, uh, you know, body of believers and your brothers and sisters in Christ so that we can all uh, edify one another the best we can. Yes. Amen. Amen. Now, I know that uh, there's a couple of us here on the panel that have expressed to me that uh, it's been a difficult day, a difficult time, uh, but we can set all that aside temporarily and uh, deal with uh, our life's problems later. But now this is time for us to just praise Jesus and and study the Bible together and have fellowship and escape the harsh realities of this world. Uh, and we've got Matthias. Um, shall I introduce Talking Doctrine or are you going to uh, speak at least for, uh, about that, Matthias? Uh, well, no, if, if you call on me, I'll, that's why I came in with TD. But um, but yeah, if you have anything for me, I'm, I'm working, but uh, just let me know. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. Well, talk and doctrine. Uh, for, for those of you who might be new here tonight, talk and doctrine. Uh, if you subscribe to Matthias's channel, you're gonna find uh, it's uh, entirely made up of live streams. Uh, the rest of us, uh, we do. I guess uh, I, I'm about half and half. I've got about over 500 live streams and about 500 productions I did without it live. I just made a video and uploaded it. Uh, but Math Matthias. Uh, really does only live streams and he's very good at it and he uh he will engage with anybody so if you think uh he or any of us are wrong about something and you want to discuss it matthias is your man or even if you agree with him he'd be glad to host you in a, in a conversation a live online conversation and uh i see last but not least uh, as promised sister renee is here Yay! yes the oh, untwisted oh, sister i was trying to sneak in <laughs> Yes, yes. You know, I'm glad to see you smiling and laughing. You must be feeling pretty well right now. Yeah, I am. I, I got to spend uh, time with my mom. That was really nice. And we just took the dog out before it destroyed the rest of the house. So we got some exercise. <laughs> so uh, I'm feeling good. Yes. Happy uh, Hi, Paula. Lisa, is that Brother Dave? Matthias and Brother Sister Renee. Hey, Renee. Yes. Yeah. Okay, okay, I think I got everybody. I, I don't have the chat open yet, so I'm going to go open that up. But I wanted to make sure I got here as soon as I could. I just put an alert out on my channel and invited my viewers over. Okay, thanks. And uh, be, before we get started, we everybody's had an introduction. So how about you? We'll, we'll tell them who uh, Renee Rowland's channel is. Oh, about. okay. Uh, my channel is the same as my name, Renee Rowland, R-O-L-A-N-D. I preach the gospel of grace unapologetically. I contend for the faith once, once delivered into the saints. Uh, and they call me the untwisted sister because I try to untwist scriptures people use uh, to try to prove that your works are necessary to either obtain or get or maintain or keep or even prove salvation. Because it's all of the Lord. It's all based on what Christ did and not what you do at all. Two separate situations. Uh, the eternal price was paid for us. That's done. Uh, but people think that how we live helps keep us saved or something. But uh, how we live determines discipleship, so, uh, uh, reward, chastisement, blessing on this earth, but never eternal life, which is a free gift. So uh, that's what I do. Yes, awesome. Awesome. And uh, you're having a great impact. Uh, pretty much every day I get notified by somebody uh, that Sister Renee has uh, made the difference in my life and that I finally understand and believe the real gospel thanks to Sister Renee. And I, I did hear that today from somebody uh, and asked me if I could call him up. And I, I called him on the phone. We had a good talk. Um, uh, Brother Anthony is his name. And uh, everybody should pray for Brother Anthony. He's recovering from open heart surgery. Uh, oh, I, know, wow. I know what it's like going through that. Ooh. And, uh, but he's uh, very, very happy about this congregation here. He feels he has a family, and That's he nice. is just so overjoyed to, to know that uh, he's not alone. Oh, and, yeah. uh, so um, um, before we get into the, uh, the kind of the subject I wanted to talk about tonight, uh, let me uh, share also that um, I personally have a lot of private conversations uh, that 
you would never know about unless I told you. And, but I, I've been talking to uh, uh, a particular person lately that has uh, been against us for a long time. And, uh, uh, but that's because he really didn't understand our, our beliefs and what we do. And, and now um, he understands better and uh, we are able to have friendly dialogues and uh, getting to know each other better. And I'm finding it very interesting. He, this person is, is very knowledgeable of the scriptures. So uh, it's a lot of deep theological discussions and that's what I love to talk about. So we're, I'm having a good time, but some people are even now are criticizing me and Math Matthias also for actually carrying on a conversation some, with someone that others do not like. And um, uh, let me ask, the, the, make make a question to everybody here on the panel and everybody in the congregation as a whole. Uh, um, do you think that we should just cut off communication if, if someone wants to engage and talk about theology? No. no, we should never cut off anybody that's interested in at least hearing us. Yeah, yeah. My my position is. Um, uh, if someone thinks I'm wrong, now you've got my attention. Let's talk about it because perhaps I'm wrong. And I've had a few people over the years convince me I was wrong and I changed my opinion. So if someone thinks I'm wrong, uh, okay, let's talk. The only thing I require is that the person is civil. If, if they want to disagree and tell me I'm wrong, as long as they're polite about it and their conversation uh, remains polite and respectful, then I'm happy to engage. Yep. And uh, I don't think we should just, uh, just because one person or one group doesn't like a particular person for whatever their reasons are, does that mean that we are all obligated to shun the person and right. not have anything to do with them? I thought that's Jehovah's Witnesses. That is not the body of Christ. Yeah, let me uh, see if uh, anybody else here in the panel has any thoughts on, on that before we, we move on. Yeah. Well, yeah, I would agree with that. I mean, certainly uh, we should be able to have a conversation and even disagree well, yeah. without resorting to ad hominem attacks uh, we or be able to have a conversation. I don't know why I'm getting feedback. I'm here, sorry, that say. was me. I'm thinking oh, yeah. oh, that's okay. Yeah. Um, you know, so I, I, I understand that uh, we can have very strong beliefs and, and disagree with one another. And as long as we're civil and we try to hear the other person's position and listen to what they have to explain. I mean, minds can't be changed if you can't have a conversation. So I agree with you, Brother Luke. All right, thanks. Well, that's, that's my point on this whole thing. It's like, if if we can't speak to those who disagree with us on doctrine, especially salvific, how can we be part of helping others come to know the truth? And just because somebody disagrees with you doesn't mean that you can't form a friendship that... Lord willing, in time, will gain trust to where they'll know that we're that we actually really do care about them, and as long as we're bold and honest and civil, it's nothing but good to have dialogue with those who are lost or those who have different doctrine. And, yeah. Every atheist. Every Muslim I've ever spoken to that's converted to the truth is because somebody that was a Christian befriended them. And over a period of time, they saw their love and grace and they were able to have answers to their questions and objections. And this does, we exactly. plant a seed. One may plant a seed, another may water, or we may plant it and water it too. But there's a difference between, like, I won't go on and debate with someone that has been overtly hostile to the gospel and they just want to trap me in a place to attack me. I'm not doing that. But if somebody wants to have a real dialogue and understand why I stand so strongly on grace and, and, and exclude works, I'm happy to explain that. I, you know, I even have a Hebrew roots guy that I, I completely doesn't get it that I am friends with. 
that I'm kind to and he's kind to me back. And that is supposed to be what we do. We, we project Christ's love, compassion, mercy, and grace and patience. But there, you know, I'm not going to force somebody to believe it. Like I'm not going to sit and argue with them and you know, all of that. I can't make anybody believe anything, but if somebody wants to hear, absolutely. If they're willing to talk to you and to hear it, it's good to at least have understanding. I mean, scripture even says, be peaceable with all men. Amen. I, I'm, I'm all for that. I, I don't know. Well, in, in this particular case, and I'm sure this is probably uh, generally true, that by talking to somebody that uh, uh, has been against me, uh, they actually can hear from my own mouth what I actually believe instead of getting misrepresented secondhand from people who want to just, uh, you know, uh, attack me and misrepresent me. So um, at least it gives me the opportunity of telling uh, him or anybody who wants to know what exactly is my position on this and that. Uh, and also it's an opportunity for me to query them and, 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 and ask them and dig a little deeper to find out exactly what they believe and compare and, uh, Hopefully, uh, uh, if they're wrong, I, maybe I can lead them to the truth. Uh, but uh, uh, there are people, though, that are trying to impose um, their will on others in this respect that um, you're not allowed to have a friend if they, uh, if, they're, uh, if they don't like them. This problem has gone back many years. Uh, you know, it's my, always been my policy not to mention any names. But when, I, when I'm bringing up a problem, I talk about uh, the problem itself, uh, the, either the bad behavior, let's call it, or the, the, the bad doctrine. Uh, and I try to address that rather than the individuals. So you don't won't catch me very often bringing up a person's name, uh, but there, there have been people in the past who have tried to impose on me uh, this idea of shunning certain people that they don't like. And part of my problems with some people is that I refuse to do that and that turned me into their enemy. So now they turn against me because I would not join them in their, uh, you know, uh, behind the scenes uh, backstabbing and creating discord. So that's what's going on. But I say that uh, as a Christian, I have not given up my freedom to choose my friends. I. I don't have to be a friend with someone just because they're a believer. And if, uh, if they have a personality I don't like being around, I'm free to not want to be their friend. Um, uh, if, if someone is not a believer, I'm still free to be friends with them. And, and may, maybe uh, through that friendship, some people say friendship evangelism uh, doesn't work, but uh, I believe it does. Uh, but I wouldn't. I think the problem with some friendship evangelism with people is that they they rely on their friendship and their light shining without ever telling the gospel and waiting that maybe someday the person will ask me why I'm always so full of joy. But no, uh, sometimes immediately we ought to always look, try to find a way to tell them about Jesus and the free gift. But But if they don't want to hear about it, then we remain their friend and wait for the new opportunity. Maybe five years later, they'll, they're, now they're interested. So by remaining friends and being kind to people, even though they may reject the gospel, that door is always kept open. And I, I think that's the right way to approach this, but I get to choose my friends. I don't have to friend, be friends with you just because you're a believer. If you're, if you're, if you're uh, let's say you have a, an abrasive personality and you're just really rude and offensive, and we do have believers like that. I, I'm not challenging whether they're saved. I'm just saying that they're, they're very immature and they got some character flaws that I don't want to put up with. Uh, okay, does anybody want to say more on that before we go into the uh, subject matter? No? Nope, nope, I agree with that. No. Okay. All right. Uh, now, I've been talking about this for at least five or six months now. I've asked everybody to send in your uh, truisms. A truism, as I'm defining, I probably invented the word truism. I don't know if it's even a word, but uh, I'm defining it as a, a, a very short um, uh, statement that is uh, very, very profound and, and powerful, stating the truth about the gospel 
in, in a very concise, profound way, in, in only a few words. And so uh, I have a few that I've been using over the years that I want to promote. And I've asked everybody in the congregation, send me your truisms. And uh, we've got a list. I've got close to 30 of these on the list now. And uh, so it's time now to begin discussing them. And it's my hope, um, my goal is to um, get everybody using these truisms. Now, you don't have to because I'm not going to here to impose my will and my wishes on anybody, but it's my desire because I believe that uh, when we're able to say something profound in, in just a couple of words, that there's a lot of power in it and we should promote these and make them common, uh, almost like a cliche, but a, but a cliche in, in a, just with a positive connotation instead of any negative connotation. Uh, so I, I will go through the list tonight, and I just want to ask everybody to, to, to talk about each one of them and tell me what you think each one of these means. And the first one I already posted, and it's ter the term uh, Christian and Christianity. In other words, if you look how I wrote it, I put Christ in all caps, and then I put I-A-N in small letters, uh, or put Christ in all caps and I N A. I T Y in sm small letters. Uh, I'm, in, in, when you write it, I do it that way because uh, I want the people to know they, they, this is about Christ. And when I speak it and I say, they say, well, what religion are you? What, what do you believe? I say, well, I'm a Christian. What? You mean Christian? I say, well, uh, I don't know what a Christian is in your mind. I don't know how you define it, but I, I'm calling myself a Christian because uh, it's all about Christ. It's not about me. Uh, and most people who think of themselves as some kind of a Christian, um, they think that uh, they get to go to heaven if they have done enough good deeds and God will then accept them. So they make it all about themselves. But in the Bible, uh, in Christianity that we find in the Bible, we find that uh, this is not about us at all. It's entirely about Christ, who he is, what he's done for us and his promise for us. So when I say I'm a Christian or Christianity, it causes people to think and ask, well, what do you mean by that? So let me ask everybody, I'm gonna go through these terms one at a time and then and just ask for everybody's feedback. So uh, whoever was eager, go ahead and, and respond to hey, that. Brother Luke, uh, just to let you know, since I say that now, it causes people to ask questions and that's what you want, a dialogue. What do you mean? It's all. What, like you said, don't you mean Christian? It does make people speak. It, it makes people ask you things. Mm -hmm. It's important yeah. because even other believers or people that claim to be Christian, when I claim why I do it, because every other church, 95% of the churches are talking about is how, how good you live. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. and that really is what most people believe. Yes. It really is. If you get down to the core of it, they'll put Jesus in there. But I, you know, I did a couple videos showing dynamics of the, the hypothetical story of the woman who got in a car accident. She gets, she gets saved and then she dies or she gets saved and then really hurt. And then later on loses her faith or gets struggling or gets angry at God, gets hooked on her medicine and resentful. And then she dies. Is she still saved? Most say no. See, cause they think they're maintaining it through their being good, being good enough. So there's so many hypothetical situations like that you present to people and most will tell you, you can't live any way you want and think you're saved. They really think they're keeping it by how good they live. So mm -hmm. when you put that out there, it gives you a chance to speak to professing Christians. I said a long time ago, my ministry was revealed to me that the people that would be getting saved are people already sitting in the church pews every, every Sunday and probably Wednesday too. Mm -hmm. Those or the ones that need the gospel because they think they are the hardest people to get saved are those that think they already are. Yeah. The uh, only with the real gospel does Christ keep all the glory. Amen. Amen. And, and so to, to by saying Christian and like explaining to people, I'm emphasizing Christ because it's about Christ, not us. Okay. Uh, then Christ is elevated and, and kept where he's supposed to be. Well, time. they try to say it, Jesus gets it the other way because it's God doing it in them. But that's yeah. nonsense. It's nonsense. Yeah. It's just a way for them to add their works. You yeah. know? 
Let me ask, uh, I want to call on people if, if you're not going to, um, if you're not anxious, I'll call on you. But how about Sister Lisa? Um, uh, some people have already adopted this because I've been urging this on for a long time. Uh, what do you think of adopting this, this kind of a terminology? I certainly think it's excellent for uh, people to um, earnestly contend for the faith in varying ways. And I think if you come up with a very clever way to actually cause people, as Sister Renee was saying, to question, well, what is that? Because they never heard it that way before. And I think there's absolutely nothing wrong with it. Personally, myself, I've chosen not to shy away from the word Christian. And the reason I've chosen not to do that, even though it has been so bastardized by the false or pagan Christianity, uh, the other religions that claim they're Christian when they really aren't, like Jehovah Witness, Mormon, etc. is because when I was a, a young girl, my dad pulled me to the side and he said, baby, in order for there to be a counterfeit, there has to be the genuine article. And that always stuck with me. So he said, no matter how many counterfeit Christians there are, you make sure you're the genuine article. And so getting into the scripture, aligning myself with Christ, being in agreement with Christ has let me let others know what the genuine article is. Not because I'm special, but just because I believe this thing and I demonstrate that I believe it in my daily walk. And so I, I have a quick example. I was at a new job and a woman was assigned to train me and she was a Catholic. And after we had spent a little time together for the first say hour, she started questioning me about my beliefs. And so when I began to break down what I believe, she said, oh, you're a born again Christian. And I said, yes, you're absolutely right. I said, and I showed her the difference between the doctrine they believe and what we believe. And she attested to that out of her own mouth. So I do think that there's certainly nothing wrong with you and what Sister Renee is doing. I think it's fantastic. But I've elected not to shrink from it because I want people to see what is the authentic. And there are counterfeit versions and we should point them out when we see them happening like Chrislam and this ecumenicalism where, you know, you can be a Catholic that becomes a Christian, but Catholics by and large are not Christian because of their tenets to that particular doctrine. And I'm sorry to say, and I feel like I can speak on this since that's what I came out of, is thoroughly pagan. But we, we're supposed to make people aware through love and patience and also uh, by example in our daily walk with Christ. Mm -hmm. uh, Brenda Z asks, who's talking now? Brenda, that's uh, Sister Lisa. Her channel is For the Most High Jesus. Okay, uh, thank you, sister. And again, um, there are people who really don't understand what this congregation is all about. And uh, we are definitely against some kind of a, a, a elevation of a clergy above a laity. I'm, where I'm I've always been against that. I know uh, uh, Sister Paula has uh, done a lot of uh, talking and teaching about that too. We don't want to elevate ourselves on the panel above anybody else. I don't want to elevate myself above anybody here. Uh, it's uh, none of us, and I'm especially not imposing any of my positions on anybody. I'm just offering these ideas for everybody to consider. It is my hope that people will adopt it. Uh, but if you have a good reason not to, that's fine. Uh, uh, I the, let me ask now, uh, Brother Dave, uh, you said you wouldn't be talking much tonight, so I'm going to have to, you said, I'll have to call on you. Brother Dave, uh, is, what do you think about saying you're a Christian? I like it. I agree with it. And it, you know, we are, you know, set apart by the Holy Spirit and, you know, we got to, 
we got to remember, Jesus said that, you know, he was the light of the world that come into the world, the light of every man. And when we uh, become God's children through Christ, you know, he, he gives us that light and, and it does us no good to, to hide it under a bush or, you know, the Bible says we, we let our light shine before others that we may glorify, you know, God in heaven. And so I may not always be a great example, but, you know, God does put me in situations where, you know, he gives the, the opportunity, uh, you know, to let that light shine. And, and it's always good to take advantage of that when God provides those opportunities. And, you know, at worst case scenario, you plant or you water a seed, you know, only God will bring the increase. So I think, you know, I really like that term Christian uh, kind of gets us away from whatever stereotypes or whatever, you know, negative things people say and say, hey, look, we love Jesus. We trust Jesus. We we know that's his word. We have the witness of the Holy Spirit in us, and we do our best to to try to follow, you know, follow in his ways, and we, we try to do our best. We're not perfect. We're imperfect people, but we're saved by a perfect Savior. And so, you know, it it, it does. It, it helps us open up opportunities to uh, point people to Christ. You know, I always like to say we, I like to try to catch the fish, and then God will go ahead and clean them up in his time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's one of the sayings that we're going to get to, actually. Uh, you'll find that some of the things on this list are you're already very familiar with, and many people are using these. Uh, but uh, let me ask uh, uh, Paula, Sister Paula, uh, what do you think of the idea of uh, saying Christ, or do you have another way you, you would prefer? I like to just say I follow Jesus because it's it tells more of what you do instead of putting a label. I, I try to avoid the labels because that's where, you know, like you're saying the same thing is that's where all the baggage comes from. And people jump to a conclusion and have you in a box. And then, but if you say something like that, or you say, I follow Jesus or whatever, it's more specific and it's more, uh, it's not the answer they expect either way. So I think that's the important thing. Um, because there is so much baggage in all sorts of terms. You could say Catholic, Baptist, you know, Episcopalian, um, Muslim, whatever. And people will automatically pigeonhole you into some, you know, box. Whereas if you say something they're not expecting, that's, you know, will get invite more conversations. So I, I think it's a good principle. I think it's unavoidable people if people want to label you they're going to label you but um there is something about the name saying the name jesus i think that is more apt to bring things right to the surface because it's such a trigger word these days mm -hmm. yeah jesus name definitely causes immediate division though there's a line drawn in the sand when you say the name jesus um let me see uh, who did not respond to this, uh, Matthias. So, uh, what what do you think of the uh, using the term Christian and Christianity? Well, I like it, and I I get what Lisa was saying, um, and that's a that's a valid point. But I myself was a Christian for most of my life and was lost. So I don't I don't ever claim to be a christian if somebody asks me if i'm a christian i'll say well you could you could call me that um or if they ask me what i am what i claim to be is a bible believer because even as a christian or when i was a catholic i i could tell you that uh that i i would have maybe said yeah i believe the bible but i would have never never i mean i didn't even know what was in it but I would have never called myself a Bible believer or a Bible believing Catholic. So um, for me, because of how lost I was calling myself a Christian, I just don't refer to myself as that. If somebody asks me, I say I'm a Bible believer. But if somebody asks me if I'm a Christian, I have lately been like, I'm a Christian. So um, I don't stay away from the word per se but because I was lost when I used to claim it basically my whole life uh, now I claim strictly just Bible believer Hey uh, Brother Luke uh -huh. I'm here to follow up with Matthias 
and what everybody said basically i used to try to distance myself from the name christian because of the hypocrisy associated with it and the small mindedness and all of that associated with it that i would have a long list i'd say something like matthias said i'm a bible believing blood bought child of the living god jesus loving jesus freak something i'd say some long list of stuff so christianity or christian makes it a lot easier for me you know i just i want something different than like paula was saying the label the label but it it's uh you know it was originally obviously an insult a, a christian was kind of a slang as a you know, as christians you know when we're in antioch i guess and uh so uh i like taking names that are used for bad that's why i call myself jesse you know yeah i'm a jezebel i i like to take things that people use for harm and and make it good but uh in this case uh i i had to I did so much to get away from being called a Christian, not because I'm ashamed of being a Christian, but because I'm ashamed of those who claim to be. And so uh, this is a nice option uh, for me on that. Yeah, thank you. I, uh, and I, I have to confess that when I do hear people uh, saying it the way I, I like it, uh, it makes me happy. <laughs> I mean, you know, you're not here to make me happy though, but. But uh, I, I do like it when people embrace it and, and see it the way I see it. But obviously, this is another example of the concept of liberty. Uh, nobody is uh, imposing this on anyone. Uh, the next, uh, uh, the next truism is uh, I posted it in the chat room. Uh, you have to scroll way up for it. I guess I could post it again right now. Uh, salvation is not a sin issue. It is a son issue. Um, and the interesting thing about this is uh, I had never heard that saying until probably about five or six years ago. And I first heard it come from our lo lovely S sister Lisa right here. First time I heard this term, salvation is not a sin issue. It is a son issue. So uh, sister Lisa, I guess, you, you should go first on this one. This is, I believe it's profound. It meets the criteria of what I call a truism. It's short, easy to understand, and a profound truth. Yes. Um, well, as I said before, one of the reasons I started my channel was coming out of a lot of the churchianity, um, which I later discovered in my walk with Christ, just how much of it is just thoroughly pagan and made up and <laughs> some of it is incredibly demonic the control issues that churches engage in which is really uh, witchcraft and a Jezebel spirit and there are a lot of pastors and churchgoers that get involved in that stuff uh, and I have no doubt that many of these people are believers believers can operate in witchcraft and in some cases they don't even realize they're doing it and so as i begin to think about my own um, sin nature things i was wrestling with and was beating myself up for it and the holy spirit ministered to me about how I, in my own rebellion, could not remove myself from his hand because I belonged to him. And when I was bought with a price, I was sealed until the day of redemption. And so really, when we see in John 10, 28, where it talks about where Jesus is saying, no man can pluck you out of my hand. No man can pluck you out of the father's hand. We have a picture of being doubly covered there. But when you add that we're sealed until the day of redemption, we are triple covered by God Almighty. All three members of the Godhead are involved in your salvation and they cannot fail. The Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. When we believe on Him, we're born again and we're sealed by the Holy Spirit of the Most High God till the day of redemption. And so then I began to realize that we were supposed to be sun conscious, not sin conscious. 
And so that's probably where you heard that in one of my videos back in the day. And I was trying to encourage people to take the focus off of their sin and put it on Jesus. It belongs on him. And this is how you begin to align yourself with Christ by looking at who he is and emulating him. Amen. Yes. Uh I'm gonna, I want everybody else's thoughts on this, but uh, can everybody see how this, in, the, in just a few words, we show what the real problem is, because in all of Christendom, I mean, when I say Christendom, I mean all the people in the world who identify themselves as some kind of a Christian. And of all of Christendom, I would say 90% of them, it, it's, I've, I've tried to figure it out over the years, and I'm estimating 90% of the people who name Jesus, uh, identify with Jesus uh, as a Christian, they still think that it's, there's an issue between them and God over sin. Instead of realizing the real issue is, what will you do with Jesus? So it's not a sin issue, it's a son issue, is explaining this profound problem and the profound truth. So uh, Brother Dave, why don't you uh, tell us what you think of salvation is not a sin issue, it's a son issue. Right, well, Ephesians 1, 7, uh, it tells us that, you know, the blood of Christ cleanses us from all sin. The Bible says in Romans 4, uh, 5 through 8, that, you know, blessed is the man to whom the Lord will impute no sin. We still have to remember that God, you know, God abhors sin, um, but thankfully, because of Jesus Christ, because of the perfect sacrifice, uh, through our faith in Christ, we have peace with God. And therefore, you know, God isn't, a lot of people paint God, uh, uh, you know, as he's up there waiting to just strike you down for messing up. Look, God knows you're going to mess up. God knows it's going to take time to grow. God knows what he's doing. And he's God. He knows, he knows every failure you're going to make before you make it. So when you learn to rest in who you are in Christ, you learn uh, that his grace is sufficient it, it keeps you going in the right direction and you don't have to live in condemnation. And so, you know, it's being in Christ is, is the most vital part to all of this. And we're only in Christ by trusting upon him. And a lot of people, they get wrapped up with trying to believe on Christ, but then trying to trust in, in, in how well they're doing. And they keep forgetting that Christ was the one and only perfect sacrifice who died once for all. And so the reason I like that saying is because even though sin is never good in the sight of God, God has given us a way to be forgiven for our sin. And he's given us a way for our sins to be removed from us and our debt to be paid through Christ. And it helps us to appreciate what he's done for us. And it helps us to grow in grace. And it actually helps us to learn to love God more. And, and as we begin to develop and grow and walk in the spirit, we uh, you know, we feed our spirit with the word and, and things of God and our spirit gets strong and we, and we, you know, our flesh gets weaker. But if we uh, feed our flesh and we neglect our spirit, then of course the flesh is going to rule. But either way, God is there. He, he loves us. He will discipline us uh, divinely for our own good to help us stay on the right path. And, you know, just, just understanding who you are in Christ and, and that God has removed your sin. He's paid your sin debt. It just helps you to appreciate God more. And as your love for God and your gratitude for God grows, you know, your 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 walk will, will blossom as well. Hey, Brother Luke. Yes. I, I like this particular one. And I was going to say it's almost the same as another truism, but you, you might have put that one down before because I, I said it one night. So I don't want to get there too soon. But uh, the sin is nobody's lost because of sin anymore. The sin was taken out of the way and nailed to the cross. Jesus took care of the sin problem. It's done. The sin problem Amen. was dealt with. And as far as God was concerned, the sin issue was dealt with before the world began. And he flew that animal and covered Adam and Eve with it. It was his plan all along because he's a lamb slain from the foundation of the world. So the sin problem is done. That That's not even a problem anymore. He took it out of the way, nailed it to his cross. But the sun is the issue, as it says. It's not a, a sin issue. It's a sun issue. If you reject the sun, he says, I will, I will, uh, the Holy Spirit's going to come and he's going to convict the world of sin because they do not believe on me. So it's a matter of believing on Christ. It's believing on the son that is the issue because he took care of the sin. So if you receive him, the sin is gone. 
He, 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 he took, he paid for the sin of the whole world, savior of the whole world, especially of them that believe. So uh, sin is not an issue. It's so unfortunate that so many Christians still preach, sin will separate you from God. Uh, you've been reconciled to God and nobody is sinless in the flesh. These people are out of their mind. Uh, somebody texted me today and said that a pastor said, you got to confess every sin. If you get one, you won't. What would you do about the sin that you don't even know you commit? David said, forgive me for the sin I do in ignorance. You know, they used to have to do a sacrifice for sins they did not even know they committed. So it, it's uh, crazy to me how anybody is still in religious bondage when it's by grace you're saved. So it's the son issue. I heard Zane Hodges and Bob Wilkin both use this in Zane uh, Hodges' book, the, this son issue, sin issue thing, uh, called Absolutely Free, in his book, Absolutely Free. I don't agree with everything Zane Hodges or Bob Wilkin say, but I agree with much of it. I got some issues with their outer darkness doctrine and stuff, because I don't even think he was talking about the church. But uh, other than that, uh, you know, they're, they're absolutely right on this. And I'm glad Lisa uh, uh, uses this, because it really does make sin really little because sin is not an issue at all anymore. Either he paid for the sin or he did not. It's not he paid for some of it and some of it's on. This is all just a mess. You know, it really is whether you have the son or not. That that determines your eternal destination. Not mm -hmm. sin, not how little or much you sin, but whether you have the son or not. Yeah. Well, when we, if we believe Jesus' claim that it is finished, if we believe that it is propitiated, that means it's sat, the debt is paid in full, satisfied, satisfied uh, God is satisfied, uh, then we, we should not ever be thinking that our salvation somehow hinges on our, uh, our getting sin out of our life. If people are always talking about that, it's a, it's a, a red flag telling me that they must not understand the gospel because uh, the curtain was torn in half. There is no barrier between man and God. The, uh, the curtain being torn in half, giving us access to the Holy of Holies is a picture of us. Now we, have a, we can have a relationship with God. Sin is no longer separating us and a barrier. We're able to have a relationship through faith and get this gift of eternal life. Um, Sister Paula, you have not talked about this yet. What do you think? Yeah, I always, um, for years, have been harping on this issue of why are Christians selling fire insurance instead of the adoption offer? Because that's what Second uh, Corinthians five twenty says: we're Christ's ambassadors. God makes His appeal through us to be reconciled to God. You can't fool somebody into it trick them into it, pressure them into it, guilt them into it, because it's an acceptance of an offer of adoption. And it has to be free, and it has to be genuine and uncoerced. And so if we, um, by emphasizing the son issue, that's what we're saying, because it's all about, did he do something or not? Do you trust him or not? Do you accept that or not? And nothing else matters until that question is answered. So mm -hmm. it can't be about anything else. And people want to always jump ahead of that and say, oh, license to sin. When, you know, the, the same in uh, Romans, it says we died to sin and we're free from sin, not to sin. So why would we want to, if we understand this is an adoption, why would we want to disobey God or <laughs> irritate God or ignore God if we understand this is a relationship that just falls apart by itself. So if we've spread the right gospel then people won't jump to that conclusion so quickly. And we just, you know, have got to get the church, the body of Christ to emphasize that, that this is an adoption offer and there's nothing else you can do. You know, we hear the, the rate comforts and people like that saying, you know, you've got to think of yourself as this terrible, disgusting worm that deserves to die before you can know you need salvation. And I'm like, no, you already know you live in an orphanage, a terrible place. You know whether somebody's offering an adoption that somehow this is going to be better. And 
it's like it's like a you know a ring in marriage you don't just accept the ring you accept it as a token of something else of a relationship and that's what we're supposed to be spreading and if we did that then people would understand i am entering into this relationship and i should act accordingly if i understood it and accept it why wouldn't i you know because you don't accept adoption papers and then you know throw them on the floor and beat your fellow servants but that's what a lot of Christians do, and that's what a lot of non-Christians think it's all about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, amen. Uh, I'm thinking of Pontius, Pil Pontius Pilate. He said, what shall we do with this Jesus? And the audience, uh, the crowd, I should say, the crowd, and I'm going to expand and say the world, the crowd, if we expanded, this is the world's view, and that is crucify him. I don't need him. And that's that's all the world thinks they don't need him. But we know as Christians uh, that uh, the issue is what will we do with this Jesus? It's a son of a son issue, uh, the son of God. Will we worship him as our God and Savior? We will believe in him and, and rely on him for our salvation. So uh, there, the next one I posted, has everybody had a turn? Matthias, uh, you haven't talked about this. Do you want to say anything about this one? Uh, I don't think I'd say anything more than what you guys said. Okay, then uh, the next one I have already posted, but I'll post it again now. Uh, oops, let me see. Movie. By the way, I tried to organize these uh, and group them as, as some the ones that are closely related. And, and you can see the beginning ones are all very much trying to make the same kind of a point. And as we move through the list, the, the uh, subject matter changes a little bit, but it's still all about the gospel. Uh, and this one, <laughs> gosh, is this, is this all about Sister Lisa tonight? No, not really. But this is also a saying I got from Sister Lisa, and it is, the gospel is believe, not behave. So you throwing and, at me first, Brother Luke? <laughs> <laughs> if you like, go ahead. Uh, well, you know, like I said, it was much the same thing in dealing with my own uh self you know it's like i made myself the guinea pig in contemplating these matters according to the scripture and once i stopped listening to the religious dogma that we get from the pulpit and by the way i'm i'm wondering let's see i guess the real pulpit is pulling people out of the pit and the false ones are pulling them down to the pit but <laughs> uh when as i began to think about it I realized it didn't have anything to do with our behavior. When you looked at Hebrews, for example, Hebrews pay attention, where uh, it listed all the patriarchs and matriarchs who were justified by faith. And we know, for example, Abraham lied, Isaac lied, <laughs> but they weren't justified or uh, made righteous because of good behavior. It was because of who God is and the covenant he made and his promises and they believed those promises and it was accounted to them for righteousness. And it's no different for us. And that's the example Hebrews is making. Paul makes it numerous times throughout Romans and other letters that it is all about our faith in Christ that puts us in right standing with God. And once we are positionally in right standing, it's no longer about our behavior. But the reason that we do adjust behavior is because we're born again. The Holy Spirit lives on the inside of us. If we do things that grieve the spirit, he's going to make sure that you're uncomfortable and you're not happy. It's only fair you're grieving him. <laughs> so you're going to be miserable too. And a lot of times it's just like that experience where you have, uh, I don't know if you've ever caught yourself. I'm not asking anybody to tell on yourself where you did something out of force of habit and you caught yourself. You said, wait a minute, 
I don't even like this. I didn't want to do this anymore. I'm a believer. I don't. And you just cast it aside. It's that kind of thing because the Holy Spirit convicts you convicts you convinces you of sin he never condemns you he just shows you where whatever it was you did was wrong but there's no condemnation it's a conviction to come out of that you know and so the more i meditated on it the more i realized it really didn't have anything to do with our behavior it was all about our faith in christ yeah lots of good example too sister Guy had sex with two of his daughters, gave birth to pagan nations out of it, gave the well-watered fields to himself, uh, lived in Sodom and Gomorrah. And it just, I mean, and but Lot's called that just righteous man. That's right. Yeah. Uh, it, it, it kills me. I just, want, I, I had to say this. I was looking up an old, old Testament verse about David praying for the sins he didn't know he commit. And there's something in Leviticus about even if you don't <laughs> really committed it, you know, it's still on your account. And these lordship people, they really think they don't sin. They're confessing it all. They they don't know. I just looked at what uh, Dr. Michael Brown said. The biggest heresy is to say all your sins, even future, are, are, are forgiven. Okay, then I'll just wait till I'm close to death so all of it's covered, Dr. Brown. Because what Jesus did wasn't enough. He's not in eternity. And the Bible says... That Jesus knew each one of us that trust in him before the foundation of the world. Why is God going to give us to the son only to lose us? Because we didn't maintain it by our behavior. It just makes me sick when they belittle the blood of Christ like that. They're not. Uh, somebody told me uh, it was Daniel. He said, Renee, don't t tell them you're not making little of sin. You're making much of Jesus. Mm -hmm. And 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 that is how I see it. They make so much of sin and so little of its sacrifice. And it is like Lisa said, it's about believing, not behaving. That gets us eternal life. It's who we know, not what we do. Sister yeah. Renee, if I can interrupt real quick. Oh, go right ahead. In my never to be humble opinion, Dr. Brown is a change agent. He's yeah. probably actually a Catholic priest in disguise because everything he pushes along with that doctrine. And I was just reviewing an expose on him that broke him down today. It was over two hours. And I, every time I see that guy, I, I, have to, <laughs> I have to ask the Lord to help me because the stuff that he spews out, is absolutely false doctrine. It is antithetical to the scriptures. Yeah. It is blasphemy against the living God and the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says where sin did abound, grace does much more abound. And they literally come against that with their blasphemous heretical dogma. Yep. And I want to send a warning out real quick to other people. Uh, the reason I he got on my radar screen was I already knew he was fake, but uh, net, uh, no, Pure Flix, which a lot of people think is Christian, and y'all need to be careful. It's not Christian, okay? Uh, it's a lot of false stuff in there, like touched by an angel, but they don't tell you the angel is Lucifer, okay? Uh with he's the on there Roma doing these Downey on there, the Catholic Roma Downey. Behind. Yes, he's Thanks on there doing a lot of these little stuff. updates, yep. mm -hmm. 10 or 15 minute blogs every day on there. And I'm like, oh, my goodness, this man is putting out lordship, damnation, trash. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. Mm -hmm. Makes me yeah. sick. So, <laughs> Brother Dave, I did Sister Lisa get you fired up? I could I could call her preaching Lisa. You preaching? You're preaching, Dave. <laughs> oh yeah, oh yeah. Nah, she definitely, uh, she's definitely making some good points. And you got to be very careful. You got to be very careful. Test all things to the Word of God. You know, if if there are some things you're listening to and they're they're beneficial, but they're not fully beneficial, then you know, chew the fat, spit the bones. Not everybody's 100 percent correct on everything that I've learned. And it's uh, you know, but the Holy Spirit will always guide us in the truth as long as we seek God. Just always revert back to Jeremiah 33 when it says, you know, seek the Lord. He'll show you things you do not understand. And even if it takes time, God will keep you, uh, God will keep you, you know, close enough to the truth to where, you know, if you begin to stray, 
uh, start hearing some bad teaching or bad doctrine, you know, God will open up your eyes eventually. I believe it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm going to try to remember to repeat this uh, throughout the, the program tonight. Um, all of the sayings or the truisms on the list here are, you'll, you can find them uh, in the description box for the, this video. Uh, and I hope you'll copy them and start using them. I'm, it's my hope by doing this that we could all uh, adopt these sayings, or at least some of the ones you really like the best, and and by repeating them, all of us, uh, we make them more commonplace because uh, I think that there's a value in, in something that is, is a really profound short statement. Um, it, it, in other words, uh, it's like a picture's worth a thousand words. Well, a truism, just a few words that has a great profound effect. So I'm hoping everybody will uh, adopt these. Um, but uh, so, um, Sister Paula, uh, is the person saved by uh, behaving or by believing? Uh, well, let me think about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, salvation is by faith. There's just no way around it. There can't. It, it's a gift, and it's by faith. And there's no way to blend that with anything else because even like Romans four draws a sharp contrast between faith and works, and wages and gifts and they can't be mixed. So this is, you know, that that phrase says it very concisely because, you know, this is uh, what you've all been saying already with the Lordship salvation and you must do certain things. There are certain things that should follow knowing the relationship, but they don't have to. And in you know, they can't affect your salvation. Otherwise, we make nonsense of like 1 Corinthians 3, where it says that the person will have their work tested by fire. And even if all they have bur- is burned up, they themselves will escape through the flames. So that you can't find a clearer statement than, than that, that yes, your works will matter, but not for your salvation. It says it point blank right there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Amen. Uh, did I miss somebody? Uh, Matthias, did you want to talk about this one? Uh, uh, the gospel is, is, uh, is believe, not behave. Um, God, I've heard it. I, I like it. I've heard it once before as God cares more about what you believe than how you behave. Mm-hmm. Um, but, uh, but yeah, uh, it's a great one. I've used it several times, really. All right. Not much to say after sleeping up after what you guys got. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. When you listen to these saints, there's really not much to you can add. Uh, I posted the next one, and this is one that I've, uh, let's say I, I submitted this. And it's the gospel is the gift and the guarantee of eternal life. Uh, to me, the, the concept of a gift uh, is a perfect picture of, of it. And because it is a gift, uh, we don't uh, work for it or pay for it ourselves. It's a gift from someone else, from Jesus. But he did work for it. He lived a perfect life, and we get credit for his righteousness. And he suffered and paid for our sins. Uh, so uh, we don't have to pay. He took our place. So he paid for this gift of eternal life with his own blood, the Bible says. And so um, the concept of a gift rules out it works uh, as part of salvation. And then the guarantee uh, of eternal life uh, is eternal security. That And uh we, as I, the word guarantee, I haven't found it in the Bible, but the, the assurance is there. There's other words that would make us conclude that it is guaranteed. Jesus guarantees eternal life to us because of our faith in him. That's what the gospel is, the guarantee I'm going to go to heaven, the guarantee I have eternal life. I don't need to worry or uh, in any way. I should have complete confidence in Jesus because he's guaranteed it. So... Uh, let me, I'll post it one more time and then ask you to respond here. Uh, whoever's eager, go ahead. The gospel is the gift and the guarantee of eternal life. Uh, 
a lot of shy saints. Uh, <laughs> I would say that you can't get much more simpler than that. Um, it, hopefully that though it's intriguing enough to people as well. The gospel is the gift and the guarantee. How can a gift be a guarantee? Well, Lord willing, I'll get in scripture to figure it out. Well, if people don't understand that salvation is not only a free gift, but also something that can't be lost, then they don't understand the gospel. The guarantee has to be part of the gospel message. That, that That's why I, I worry when people ask me, did I lose salvation? Can I lose? Well, if you have to ask me that, I, I really fear you don't understand the gospel. The gospel is that Christ paid your sin debt. Not from the moment you believe. Not if you, you believe and then you maintain your salvation by how good you live. But but he paid your sin debt. The, everything you, all your sin was future when he died. That blood is applied to the past and the future. That blood is taken care of. Just like when it was the land, the sin of Israel was paid for for the whole year. But Jesus died once for all. And if he didn't, if his blood only covers past sin, then he, then I don't know what people do about the sin they committed uh, after. I mean, I, I don't know how they do. What do they do? I mean, I it, it can't be just past because all my sins were future when he died. Hey, Renee, Sister Renee, I wanted to. I don't mean to interrupt you. I wanted to bring a point up when you said that last night. I was in a discussion with three guys who were literally cornering me on their channel. And I was standing up for the fact that Christ paid for all our sin. You know, God has removed our sin as far as the East is from the West. These people had the audacity to say that they've gotten so good at walking in the spirit that they can't even remember the last time they sinned. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I hear that all the time. <laughs> I hear it all the time. That What about the sin of omission, the sin they don't even know they commit? The, full, the pride and spiritual pride, that's a big one. They just boasted in themselves. That was sin. They're, they're, I mean, people are just so blind to how much we fall short of God's glory constantly in our in our flesh. Our mind is still our flesh, and so we have to battle with it. That's also a sinful place. So it's it's just silly when people really think they don't sin anymore because they think they're keeping the Ten Commandments. It's just it's crazy to me because since I've been saved and walking strongly in my faith, I have become more aware. Of how much I fall short. You, some might look at my life and go, well, she's really a woman of God. And they wouldn't see that sin. But I'm more aware of it. You know, it's like, I, it's not that I'm condemned. It's just that I'm hyper aware of how much I'm not as good as God. Even my yeah. good deeds are often motivated by selfishness. Because I want to feel good. Because it felt good to do it. You know, not just to do it because it's right, but because it felt good to do it. So I got something out of it, too. You know, I, I get this. I, I understand how fallen my flesh is. And it just it makes me crazy. But the guarantee of salvation, this verse is the gospel is the gift and the guarantee. The guarantee is important here. Because if you think salvation can be lost, then that means you don't really understand it to be a gift. How can you lose something you didn't do anything to get in the first place? It doesn't even make sense. Your your filthy rags righteousness wasn't good enough to get you saved. How is it going to be good enough to keep you saved? Amen. It doesn't make sense. The guarantee is important. Uh, Brother Luke, your mic's not on. Thank you. Thank you. Um, it's called gospel. And that's that's it cannot be good news if it's not guaranteed, if we're in doubt, uh, or we're like another one, Lisa says, is not, it's salvation, not probation. We're not on probation based upon how well we behave. It's a guarantee. It's settled. It's undoable. It's irrevocable. Only if, if that, that's, if it has to be the case or else we cannot call it good news. Um, who Amen. wants to talk more about this? I do. I do. <laughs> uh, what, I had to start laughing, Brother Dave, when you said that about how they can't even remember when the last time was they sinned. I'm sorry, my mic was on. <laughs> I just started laughing because it's so ridiculous. Ah, uh, but... thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Lisa, I'm but... trying to tell you, sister, Matthias, Matthias watched the actual discussion 
And these guys were on some whole nother level. Say, you don't know what they were smoking, but it was some powerful stuff, huh? Okay, let, let's look at what the Bible says about this. Now, first of all, let's take a look at what a gift is, because I think maybe because we live in Mystery Babylon, we don't understand what a gift is. But a gift, according to the Bible, okay, <clears throat> we we have a wrong connotation of what a gift is, I think, because people always presume there's some strings attached when somebody gives you a gift. They have an ulterior motive. All right, but let's look at what the scripture says in Ephesians 2, 8, 9. It says, for by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. I'm reading from the King James Version. Now, if we look over in Romans eleven twenty nine, 29, it says, For the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. He does not give a gift and then change his mind and take it back. Salvation is a gift declared by God Almighty who cannot lie. It is an immutable fact that he cannot lie. So if a person is not in agreement and belief, remember, we're supposed to align ourselves with Christ. We're supposed to develop within us the mind of Christ. We're supposed to be in agreement with the Lord Jesus Christ. Now he has declared, I am the Lord. I change not. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He has declared salvation is a gift. If it's a gift and he can't take back his gifts, what's the problem? Yeah. Amen to that. I mean, what part, what part of not of yourselves do people not understand? What part of not of works so that no man may boast do people not understand? Clearly they don't. They make, they do. You will tell, you can show people these scriptures and they will sit there with suspension of disbelief <laughs> and they do not believe the Bible. And I'm like, well, okay. My goodness, sister, this guy in the discussion last night told me that the English, we, that, that you have to study the Hebrew and the Greek if you're ever going to get to the real truth because all English Bibles are wrong, he said. Mm -hmm. Let me say something uh, uh, just on a different point here. The uh, Someone in the chat room asked, uh, what is Brother Dave, Dave's channel? Um, everybody here on the panel, uh, I think, has probably made comments. When we make a comment in the chat room, you can go to the far right and point, and you'll see these three dots. When you click on those three dots, there's an option for you to go to their channel. So uh, you can access each of our channels by doing that. And then I hope you will subscribe to all, all, all of us. Um, okay. So um, the next, uh, let me see, who didn't talk? Uh, Paula, you did. Did you talk about the gift and the guarantee yet? Uh, not on this question. No, it was, it was very similar to the one before, but I posted a link in the chat to an, a post of mine called Go to Heaven. And at the end of it is a long list of all the things that happen the moment we're saved. And I'm just, I'm not going to read, I got scriptures for every one of them, but I'll just read the list real quick. And because all of this has to be undone in order to be unsaved. Um, declared righteous, become children of God, clothed with Christ, belong to Christ, not ourselves, heirs according to the promise, flesh was crucified, redemption through Jesus' blood, forgiveness of our sins, become God's own possession, sealed with the Holy Spirit who guarantees our inheritance, made alive with Christ, raised up and seated with Christ in heaven, in heaven, brought near to God, have peace with God, citizens of God's household, sealed for the day of redemption, not the day you change your mind, buried or the day you sin, buried and raised with Christ, made alive and forgiven, died but now, like life now hidden with Christ in God, protected from the evil one, given eternal life, set free and purified, born again, given an imperishable reservation in heaven 
ransom, kept from falling, our mm. God's temple, washed, sanctified, justified, and a new creation. Woo! All of that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that all yeah, has but, to go away. Yeah, but is what oh, they'll oh, say. Oh, uh, preach it. Yeah. Rolling, rolling <laughs> off her top. No, that yeah. was an amazing list. I was just shouting in the background. I'm glad my microphone was off. <laughs> Yes. I just read what it says in the Bible. I just made a list. That's all. But do you know that, Sister Paula, you could run down that list with some of these people and they will literally go, yeah, but. Mm -hmm. And that's the problem is it's such a long list. You, mm -hmm. you tell me you have to you can undo all of that. All of it. They have to undo to lose their salvation. Yeah. So that leads Sister us to Paula, send me that list. <laughs> That, that gets us to the next uh, the next uh, truism that I'd like us to consider, and I posted it. The gospel is eternal security. Now we have some people are they say they don't believe in eternal security, and, I, and there are some people that tell me they do believe in secu eternal security, but a person does not have to understand and believe the, in eternal security as uh, to get saved. That they can understand that later, and I really object to that because I believe that the gospel um, is the understanding and belief that we are guaranteed eternal life, that, 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 that there's nothing to worry about, this blessed assurance. If we don't have the understanding of the gift and the guarantee, if we don't have this blessed assurance, this eternal security, then we do not understand the gospel. And then if we don't understand it, we're not believing it. So uh, the gospel is eternal security. Uh, who, who wants to go first on that one? But, I mean, it's, it's kind of the same as that, that the, the gospel is the gift and guarantee. So I'm not going to repeat myself on it, but I want to say that if a person, that, so somebody was saying, you know, there's a lot of division in the body of Christ about the gospels. <laughs> there's only one gospel That's that right. saves us. And it's clearly spelled out in 1 Corinthians 15 that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was there and he was again on the third day according to the scriptures. That's the gospel message that saved us. Paul said it's the one we stand in and the one that saved us. Okay? It's what God's done for us. If somebody comes against that or adds to it, it's another gospel. It's another Amen. gospel. Front loading, back loading, doesn't matter. Another gospel gospel and they are not part of the body of christ i'm sorry i don't care how much they use the name of jesus or how much they go to church or how good they live or how many habits they stop they are not part of the body of christ if they hate mock and reject the real gospel message is this the truth mm -hmm. yeah that's absolutely right yeah, yeah. matthias you haven't spoken for a while you you, you do you think it's uh, fair to say that the gospel is eternal security? Uh, yeah, yeah, because it's um, it goes right along with one of the essentials. Uh, if you don't understand eternal security, then by default you are working. Whether you think, oh, it's by grace alone, I can't work my way to heaven, but I can walk away from it. Well, you're working to make sure you don't walk away from it, and even if you don't realize it. So uh, without eternal security, there is no gospel. So the reverse of this truism is true as well. Mm -hmm. Amen. Uh, let me see. Uh, who hasn't talked about this one? I'd like to read a verse, Brother Luke. Go ahead. Well, if you look, you know, like Renee was saying, people just can't seem to understand, you know, what salvation even is or what Christ actually finished on the cross. But there's a very specific verse that gives us a lot of insight to this problem. If you look in first John chapter five, verse 20, I want to read that real quick. It says, and we know that the son of God is come and hath given us an understanding. Okay. There's the key right there. The son of God, when we put our trust and faith in Christ and we're born again by believing and trusting on him alone, we receive not only the Holy Spirit, but the, the scripture says we receive an understanding. What is this understanding? It says that we may know him that is true. And look what it says. 
and we are in him that is true even in his son jesus christ this is the true god and eternal life go ahead mm -hmm. yeah so if we i mean if we sit there and in and, and one breath say that you know jesus saves and then in the next breath say jesus doesn't really save jesus needs me to be a co-savior then we don't we're, we're lacking the understanding that we're in him and he is eternal life and the simple fact that Eternal life is eternal. If it ceases to be eternal, it was never eternal to begin with. And as Sister Lisa pointed out, God cannot lie. These people don't believe the gospel. They do not believe. And I keep saying, it's like back in the day, they used to have a commercial that was a, a little owl with the Tootsie Roll, Tootsie Pop. And the the uh, little boy hands the owl his uh, Tootsie Roll Tootsie Pop and he asks him how many licks does it take to get to the center of the Tootsie Roll Tootsie Pop and you know the story that Al bit his Tootsie Pop and handed back an empty stick but the point is how many times do these people get to say I don't believe that I don't believe that I don't believe that when you show them clearly in the scripture before we get to call them unbelievers yeah. Yeah. Now, while you're on a roll there, Sister Lisa, I, I mentioned it wasn't on the list, but as we're discussing this, I recalled it and I mentioned it. So let's talk about it. Another truism I just put back in the list now, and that is a saying that Lisa said I, I first heard from Lisa, and that is uh, it's called salvation, not probation. So, <laughs> uh, uh, what do you mean by that, Sister Lisa? Well, I kept seeing people paint basically salvation as something that, okay, you have the lordship damnation heretics that say you got to do all this stuff to be saved or make sure you're saved. But then you had the people who were backloading salvation saying, once you are saved, there needs to be fruits and a list of fruits. And I kept saying, well, What's the timetable? I mean, if that's true, then God should have put in this book exactly when we're supposed to see the result of these fruits. I mean, the Bible teaches that uh, a parent is supposed to train their child in the way that they should go. And then it says, and when he is old, he will not depart. It doesn't say when he's young. Because a lot of time people do stupid stuff when they're young, okay? But and then as they learn and they grow and they develop some more maturity and they start to see as the devil tests them what's real, they return to the things that they've been trained. So I didn't understand why they kept making it about works, works, works on, you know, this side of salvation as opposed to the lordship damnation heretics that make it before you can even get saved. And I said, this is, this is not right. This doesn't work. God, when I look at eternal security shown numerous times in the Bible, it is never contingent upon what you do. Probation is contingent upon what you do. And if you don't do the right things, you get locked back up. And as Sister Paula so astutely pointed out, there are so many things that you would have to undo that are only done by the power of God, by the way. It's not even a human effort. It's nothing human that was involved. So how are you even going to undo it when you didn't even do it to begin with? So when I looked at that, I said, "Is salvation is an absolute guarantee. It is a the right of the person who is believed because God himself has declared it. And when a person comes along and saying, well, uh, yeah, but you could lose it because of this, that and the other thing. What you're really saying is God is a liar. Thank you. I want I just want to say. I want to tell people regarding salvation based on what Lisa just said, get your butt out of the way. And I mean that in double entendre. Get your butt out of the way 
Move <laughs> on out the way. It's got nothing to do with you. And then get your butt, butt, butt. Get that out of the way, too. <laughs> you got to get that butt out of the way. You are not, you, like she said, you have nothing to do with it. The covenant was between the father and the son. You can see that covenant walking with the torch in the furnace with Abraham when he was put to sleep. Abraham was knocked out. He didn't have nothing to do with it. All he had to do was believe, and he was made righteous. Same thing. We got nothing to do with that covenant. The father paid the son for your sin debt. Believe it. It's got nothing to do with you. Get out the way. That's what Amen. I said. Amen. Amen. Uh, Matthias, uh, what what do you think of that one? Uh, it's called salvation, not probation. Well, I was just thinking, move, sinner. Get out the way. Get out the way. <laughs> ah, you wild. You wild. <laughs> you know, I want to bring up a point. Uh, I want to bring up a point that goes behind what Sister Lisa said, because that's so true. I would like to have the verse or chapter and verse that says how many, you know, good works must we have until we have reached the safe zone? How many, how many fruits must be produced until we've reached the safe zone? And how many sins must be put away before we reach the safe zone? Now, I'm not saying of a Tootsie Pop. <laughs> right. Well, I'm not saying that I'm not saying that we shouldn't bear fruit because we when we abide in Christ, it's only through Christ that we even bear fruit to begin with. OK, I'm not saying that we shouldn't put away certain sins. We're told and exhorted throughout the scripture to, to you know, do certain things. And I'm all for that. But to make that a uh, a condition of you staying saved. That's a complete denial of the sufficiency of the finished works of Christ. And that, like Renee said, that is another gospel. And Paul says, I'm so soon, you know, I'm, I'm marveled that you're so soon removed from the gospel of grace unto another gospel, which is not a gospel. So he's saying it's not, it's not a gospel at all, as Renee said. But there's so many that do this today that it's, it's literally mind-blowing. Yeah. Well, brother, well, we Dave, really... if, you, if you want, dear brother Dave, uh, I can give you the verse to answer your question. Um, and that is that Paul wrote, if you are under the law, you put yourself under a curse because now you're required to follow the law perfectly without any fault. So the, 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 what level is needed for someone to be safe without Jesus, but on their own. It's absolute is, perfection, right? Yeah. If you're, if you're not going to rely entirely on Jesus and you're going to want to be relying on your own merit, then uh, the, the standard is perfection. And, and, and that's why the, the Jesus told his apostles, it's impossible. He said, they said, then if that's the case, Lord, how can we be saved? How can anyone be saved? He says, aha, you get it now. I'm, I'm inserting that. He says, with man, it is impossible. It's impossible to meet the standard, Brother Dave. But with God, it's possible. So Jesus is our Savior, God. Amen. Uh, okay, Pro Sister Paula, uh, you didn't talk about this one yet. Uh, uh, it's called salvation, not probation. Yeah, 1 Corinthians 6.20 says you were bought at a price. You're not your own. You were bought with a price. So how can you take your salvation back when it doesn't belong to you? You don't belong to you anymore. So you, because that's what they'll say. They'll say, he, he, he won't take it from you, but you can take it back. And I'm like, no, it says you're bought with a price. You're not your own. So how can you take it back? And you're sealed. How can you take that back? So this is just more of not understanding what salvation is, that what's, you know, you need free will to make that choice. But once you make it, you are protected from yourself or it isn't a guarantee. It's like saying that if you are stuck in a well, we like to use that illustration, and you know somebody hands you a rope to pull you out, you're not saving yourself. But what they're saving is saying is that Jesus can let go of the rope and throw you back in because you didn't say something right or you didn't do something right. And so then it is about you saving yourself. It, there's no other way around it. It makes you your savior if it has any kind of condition on it. Yeah. So, uh, Sister Paula, uh, while we've got your attention, you can be the first on this, this next truism. I posted it. I'll do it again. Religion says do, but Jesus says done. 
that's the unique thing above all the religions of the world that we need to emphasize because all of them say do. All of them say uh, you have to reach God's level where in ours says God reached your level and you have to do this. And they say, and ours says you can't do this. It's just like uh, the illustration of a little kid playing baseball and breaks the neighbor's window, the kid can't pay for it. And yet the window must be fixed. So the responsible party, the parent pays for the window. Mm -hmm. And that's what Jesus is the responsible party. Cause they'll say, you know, this gets into another issue of, of uh, one person not being able to pay for another person's crime. Well, in this case, it's the child who's unable to pay for what they did and is not a responsible adult in that scenario. And so we were collectively tricked by Satan into this first world. That wasn't our fault as far as most of us are concerned that, you know, we did not do that, but we did other re acts of rebellion. And yet we can't pay the price. We can't replace the window. So that's what Jesus had to do. And all we have to do is accept that on you know, what he did vicariously. And how can that be something we do? Again, it's like saying you saved yourself if you hold onto the rope be pulling you out of the well. You did not save yourself. Nobody says that. They mm -hmm. are grateful for the rope. And hanging on to it is, is simply accepting it, not pulling yourself out. Yeah, amen. That's why he's our savior. He does the saving. Uh, but uh, let me define religion as, as I define it. Now, I know that if you look in the dictionary, you'll find various definitions. They're all probably valid de definitions. But I think the def proper definition of religion is a, all religions are simply systems of uh, a set of rules of do's and don'ts uh, in man's attempt to earn approval or acceptance from God. But that's why I say Christianity is not a religion. It's not a set of rules, do's and don'ts, trying to earn approval. Uh, it's, uh, it's a relationship with Jesus, that uh, he, uh, the belief that Jesus has done what was needed. And uh, he guaranteed me eternal life and uh, faith in him and his promise. Uh, so uh, that's why... Uh, this Christianity is unique and unlike the, all the religions of the world that are based upon do's and don'ts, ours is based on what, was, what has already been done for us. Uh, who wants to go next on? Uh, if it's not, this is what drives me crazy. It's salvation, not probation. That's the, that's the word you're using, right? No, we're on to another one. It says religion says do, Jesus says done. Okay. Uh, well, here's the thing. Again, the gospel is believing what God's done for us, not anything we're doing. Like Paula said, we're not even capable of doing it anyway. At least there's no human involved. We got to get ourselves out of the way. We either believe what God did for us or we don't. And anybody that has to add to it is not believing the gospel. Because if they believed it, they wouldn't feel the need to change it. So um, uh, it, it's very frustrating <laughs> because it says that we have passed from death to life. When we believe in Christ, we have passed from death to life. Our spirit is alive in Christ. We were dead, but we're alive. What, what's God going to do? Kill that spirit that he just brought to life? It said that we shall never perish. And if, if we have life, and that life is eternal, and you can lose it, then it's not eternal. Let's just, it's common sense. If you have a life, and that life is eternal, and that life can end, then it's not eternal life. And so they don't believe the record God gave of his son, and they call God a liar, like Lisa was saying. For if the record God gave of his son is he gives us eternal life, and that life is in his son. If you don't believe that, you call God a liar, and if you say you can lose salvation, you're calling him a liar. If you say you can lose salvation, you're calling Jesus a liar because he said he shall lose none, all that the father has given him he always does the father's will and his father's will is that he'll lose none and raise them up at the last day so Amen. you just call god a liar you call jesus a liar you call all of it a lie because you can't simply believe so you change it because it doesn't seem right to man but if our gospel be hid it be hid to them that are lost 
It's not, it doesn't say if the gospel's hid, they're just a little confused. They might still be a brother. They're not. I wanted to believe that too, but they're not. It, it makes me sad because I, I want these people saved. I really want them saved. But there's only one saving message. And if you reject it or mock it or hate it, I can't, you're not believing it. And that's how we're saved, by believing. If you can lose eternal life, that life's not eternal and you have not passed from death to life. And that makes God a liar, flat out. I got one word to tell us that. Luke's muted again. Amen. Hey, I'm sorry, I, I, Sister full. Lisa, I was going to say, th this sounds like one that you would say. Uh, Jesus, I mean, uh, religion says do. Jesus says done. Amen. To tell us that, which is it is finished. And, you know, if you read in John... 1930 it says when jesus therefore had received the vinegar he said it is finished and he bowed his head and gave up the ghost jesus and you can refer to isaiah 53 if you want to see where it talks about all the things that he did for us with uh his death on calvary there but you know we have a saying in christendom what can wash away my sin nothing but the blood of Jesus. And when you when you look at the scripture in its context, for these people to say it's not enough, when this, <laughs> I was just looking at that in Hebrews 2, uh, 3 and 4. How should we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him. Hear that? Them that heard him. They're not listening. They keep rejecting. We have heard and received, but they are denying. They are denying his word. They cannot hear him. They are in darkness. And then it goes on to say, God also bearing witness them witness both with signs and wonders and with divers miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost according to his own will. So they're denying the very will of God. The father sent the son to be the savior of the world. He is the savior. It's all done, paid for, gift wrapped and handed to us. And they say, I don't believe it. Amen. Amen. Okay. My microphone's on. Good. Uh, amen. I wanted to say that uh, my son's aunt is in there going, woo, amen, after she heard Lisa. Awesome. Now, Brother Dave, I'm calling on you. You can't remain so quiet tonight. I put up a new one. Let me do it again. It's related to the last one. The last one was um, religion says do, Jesus says done, and similar to that, on a, in an attempt to have some humor so we can lighten up. This ah. one is, working for salvation is religious doo-doo, so flush it down the toilet. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, if people believe that they're going to somehow earn right standing with God because they you know, helped the old lady across the street or they gave a few bucks to the homeless man or they showed up in church a few holidays, they're heavily deceived. All right, we are saved uh, unto good works, and that is true, but the Bible says not to maintain or, or preserve our salvation, but it's because they are profitable unto others. Titus 3.8 says that we should be careful to maintain good works because it is profitable unto men, but here's the key. When it comes to salvation and being saved and born again, the Bible says there's something we must do, and that is believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. When it comes to our life and service and the good works or the stuff that we do for the Lord, there are things the Bible says we should do. And the reason we should do them is not to be saved or stay saved, but it is because it helps shine our light. It helps spread the gospel. It helps 
uh, uh, our love being shown to our neighbor. Why do we do these things? Because it is profitable unto others. So it's it's there's something you must do to be saved, which is believe, and then there's something you should do, which is be careful to maintain good works after you're saved, not to stay saved, but because it profits others for the glory and the kingdom of God. Okay, Amen. Um, well, um, I'm I'm really anxious to continue on, but I know the time uh, is after eleven in the east. So I think we ought to start winding it down. We've only done about eight, seven or eight out of uh, about thirty on the list. Luke, so you might want to you might want to push a fifteen minute uh, a time extension. Luke, you got a good about seventy people hanging in here with you right now. All right. Um, was it, anybody have to leave because it's too late? I understand. But Renee, uh, regarding your phone call, I needed to talk to you about something. So uh, before you do that, um, so. Um, <clears throat> I don't know. Is there anybody who needs to leave now? Uh, let me let me know, and I'll. Otherwise, we we'll, we'll can go further if you want. Uh, the next one, by the way, this one that I just posted up there uh, uh, about uh, what is it again? Control V. Uh, working for salvation is religious doo doo. So flush it down the toilet. Obviously, it's it's a tr it's a truism, but it's also humorous. Uh, so let me post the next one because it's similar. I've tried to group these together uh, to based on uh, the, the, if, if the point's similar, they're in the same group. And this one is, um, let me read it and then I'll post it. Religion sets rules, Jesus sets us free. So uh, who wants to go first on that one? Religion sets rules. Jesus sets us free. Well, that's exactly what's going on with what I call, as I said a couple of times tonight, pagan Christianity. Uh, a lot of things that we've learned in the church that have nothing to do with the word of God. You know, it's the traditions of men. It's modern day Phariseeism. And we have to be careful to make sure we pull our Bibles out and look and see. Now, you guys got to be careful with this because these some of these preachers are real slick. And they can twist these scriptures to make it seem like, you know, the service to them is service to God. You got to be real careful with that because they are putting a lot of people in bondage with that stuff. So be prayerful, be careful about what you receive from people because a lot of times these people will try to take the scripture to actually put a yoke of bondage on you and when scriptures are taken out of context that's very easy to accomplish so you have to be led by the spirit on that and maybe even seek someone if you're a new a baby in Christ, seek someone older that's in Christ that you trust. And I mean older as far as their walk with Christ, not necessarily their chronological age. And uh, get counsel because some of these churches are crafty and not all of them are godly places to be. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, well, I know it's very similar. Religion sets rules. Jesus sets us free. Uh, it's similar to religion uh, says do and Jesus says done, a similar point, but uh, sets us free. Uh, I think that is important uh, to, for us to understand. Not only uh, is does Jesus say it's done, the work that was necessary for my salvation has been done, it's completed, God is satisfied, but also Jesus set me free from bondage. I'm not under uh, the law. And uh, so I'm free. But now, of course, we we that we don't interpret that as that we have a license to sin because we know sin comes brings its own consequences in our lives. So we don't want to sin, but we're free from sin's power over us because the Holy Spirit is in us, uh, desiring to transform us. Um, okay, anybody want to say more about uh, Jesus sets rules? I mean, religion sets rules. Jesus sets us free. Well, who, the, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. And 
the, the who the sun sets free is free indeed. So the whole accusation of it's a license to sin is ridiculous because sin is bondage. And it says sin shall not have dominion over you for you're not under law. You're under grace because the strength of sin is the law, not freedom. Mm-hmm. Amen, Sister Renee. Really? Mm-hmm. I wanted to say one other thing, and that yeah. is uh, what Sister Renee was saying there. Um, I've said this before. People do not trust the Holy Spirit to do his job. And I'm sorry. Or actually, I'm not sorry. I am 100% convinced that the Holy Spirit has my number, has your number, has the number of everyone on this panel, everyone out there in the listening audience, that if he needs to pull your coattails about something, he absolutely will. And I don't understand why these religious folk, as you're saying religion, think they need to go around picking sin off of other people. If a person is born again, God got God has their number and he's going to set them straight about it. You know, and I don't understand why they think they need to run around being uh, uh, fruit inspectors all the time as though the person who's not born, who is born again, cannot hear the voice of the living God speak to them, speak to their heart, convince them and convict them of sin. That has been my experience and every experience of every believer that I've ever met. They'll say, God's got my number and he sure let me know about something when I didn't even think it was sin. He corrected them. Amen. Lisa, you know how many times I've said, if people really say well, if that's true, it's just a license to sin. You can, I go, do they even know the? Do they have the Holy Spirit? Are they I don't think aware so. that he, uh, if he's grieved, like you said earlier, you're grieved? Is, are they not aware of the work he does once he's there? I mean, nobody. Sister, I don't think so. I don't think they do know. And that's the evidence to us that they're not saved that's because true. they don't have that conviction from the Holy Spirit. You cannot live continuously in sin as a believer. I don't care. I'm not setting a time limit. Don't misunderstand. Not without consequence. Not right. Exactly. Consequence. It might continue for a year, two, three. I don't know. It's not my business. I'm Thank not. Uh, I can't judge you. There. You're God's servant, and I don't have the right to judge you. If I see something that I think is wrong or that you are in peril of, I should pray for you. And if I am led by the Spirit to speak to you, then I will. But a lot of times people go around thinking, oh, I think I see this sin in this sister or brother's life, and they want to start picking at you about it and yep. coming at you about it. And the Lord did not instruct them to do that. Thank they just you. think they have a right to go around being the sin police. Oh, and I hate it. The gave me a message for you, Lisa. The oh, yeah. The father told me that. I'm like, the father can speak to me. <laughs> the father can speak to me. I can't tell you. Exactly. Him. The father has a word for you. He told me. I'm like, no, he didn't. He did not like <laughs> that because you don't have him. You don't know him. I have heard Sister Renee testimonies from people, you know, some, everybody doesn't grow up with a consciousness of God. They grow up in families that were just absent of any kind of religion. Right. And I heard this witness from a sister that was a, involved in a lesbian lifestyle. And she honestly didn't know what the Bible said about it. She had no clue. She didn't realize it was sin. She grew up in an age where everybody's saying it's wonderful. It's okay. It's an alternative life stop and she got saved and the Holy Spirit began to minister to her and pulled her and her partner out of that. Yep. So it it was all by his work. Yep. Same thing happened on my channel. I had a, a, a married a person who was gay married to another gay person and they got saved on my channel. Right. Didn't condemn them. I told him, hey, you know what the Bible says about it. I'm not, I'm not, you got to get saved. That's all I know about you. You Amen. need the Lord. That's it. That's all I'm, I don't, I'm not telling you to do anything, nothing. You need to get saved and let the Lord talk to you. And they are divorced now. Uh, that person still struggles with the attraction, but they have gotten a divorce and uh, they are feeling that right now the best thing for them is to not have any. Uh, relations right now because they're working through this but I didn't tell them 
the, they, nobody condemned them. They, they got saved. You and didn't have to because right. the Holy Spirit did his job. And that's what gets on my last onion that these people do not trust the power of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. And this is a sign to me that they are not saved. That's why they're outside of a gay pride parades going repent of your sin. That's not going to save anybody. No, it's not. Even if you did stop miraculously your flesh miraculously stop wanting what it's want its whole life. Uh, that still wouldn't save you. Why are you trying to deal with behavior? You need to get them into belief, not the behavior change. People That's really don't believe that all of their sin is paid for in Christ. The Thank good you. news is God is not angry at the sinner anymore. All sin has been punished Thank in King Jesus on Calvary. Thank Believe you. in him and his death, burial, and resurrection, and you too will receive the gift of pardon, which is the forgiveness of sins and eternal life. Mm. I heard a guy say that he had a, a gay friend that asked him, Okay, you're, he was in a false religion at the time, and he was asked, so I, I'm gay, so I, I'm a sinner? And he said, yeah, you are. Okay, I would have said, uh, I, don't, I don't care about you're gay right now. Are you breathing? Yes, you're a sinner, and so am I, and so is everybody else here. I'm not pointing you out as anybody any different, and that's right. what needs to be done. You know, you are no different. Your, your sin is different than mine, but it's still sin. These and preachers in these pulpits... That have pushed these people away that are homosexuals. Yes. And blocked them from coming into the kingdom. I've heard these idiots stand up in their pulpits and say, a homosexual is not welcome in this church. They're going to have to answer to the living God. Yes, they are. Because even if that person believes they were born this that way, Jesus said you must be born again. And the good news is you can be. I don't care what state you're in. Yep. How dare they? They will answer. But they do that. They will answer. But what's worse than that is they're telling people they're reprobate if they're gay. So their minds are just too far from God to ever be saved. That's the worst of it. That's yeah, this, uh, this particular sin, for some reason, or many people are isolating it and making it a totally separate thing from everything else. I want to get Sister Paula's thoughts on all this. And the last thing we said was religion uh, says... Um, um, sets the rules. Uh, Jesus sets us free. That's what we they were responding to, Sister Paula. Yeah, I did a uh, some time ago a uh, Truth Finders hangout on heresy, and at the end, I just asked a bunch of questions. What you know, how to test for it, and one of them was, does it make people afraid or have doubt? And the another related one was, does it make them distrust, want to distrust or control other people? And that's what these things do that everybody's been talking about is trying to make Christians doubt either their salvation or, you know, their their right standing with God or whatever, however they want to put it, because of some certain sins or others. And the other part, because there's two issues going on here, is one, one is that religion thing that makes you doubt all the time it always keeps you second guessing and so you can't do anything that's what basically what it does is just, it's uh paralysis by analysis you know always or uh, or some people say navel gazing you know you're just always looking at yourself once again where's your focus it's not on jesus it's on yourself and what you're doing wrong and you must be out of fellowship and worry 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 and the other thing is that this is a you know, they, all the condemning of, you know, we go back to 1 Corinthians 5, which we were just, you know, in the other study going through 1 Corinthians, where it's at the end, it says, who am I, what are we doing judging those outside the church? Are we not to judge those inside? So when they come at people with that kind of a quote unquote evangelism to say that, you know, you have to think you're vile and you have to, you know, you just have to tell them how awful they are. That's not the gospel, first of all. It's not a, a message of reconciliation. And second of all, they're outside the church. Of course they are that way. What do you want them to do about it? They can't. They can't fix the window. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. The, the next one, let me ask uh, Brother Dave to comment on this one first. And this is uh, one that... Uh, 
I coined this phrase, and that is, grace means no works. And of course, that's, uh, I'm paraphrasing from Paul's uh, teaching that uh, grace and uh, works, uh, are key. you cannot mix them together. Uh, if you have works, it's no longer grace. So um, if, when, if people say that they understand and believe in the grace message, and, and then they think that works uh, are somehow uh, are apply to us for our salvation, it's clear that they don't understand that grace and works don't cannot be mixed together. There, uh, it's an oxymoron. To, it's oil and water. It's it's like a magnet repelling the other end, the other side. Uh, so to me, the idea of defining grace as no works. Grace means no works, brother Dave. Yeah, absolutely, brother Luke. They. Um they, this is this is you know the the um, the classic mixing of of salvation and service. Um, you know, salvation comes by grace. The Bible's very clear that you are saved by grace. Period. Through faith, it's a gift of God. So we're saved by grace. Grace is what actually saves us, and grace is actually Jesus Christ. The Bible says that Christ, uh, you know, Christ came uh, in all grace and truth. And so when it comes to our salvation, you can't add anything of yourself to that. It's literally, do you trust the person in the finished work of Christ? When you become a child of God and God is uh, wanting you to, you know, or use you in type of service to him, people have to remember that the only, any good work that comes out of us only comes because of Christ working through us. And it's, and it's the good works that we do. Grace uh, teaches us, you know, to do the things of God. And it's not based off of a obligation or a sense of duty for us to be right or stay right with God. It's something that flows out of us as we are connected uh, uh, to Christ. And, and it's he's working in us, on us, and through us. And naturally, you know, works will flow from that. Um, to varying degrees, depending on, you know, are you in, you know, are you in the word, how much are you in, or how much are you uh, walking close with the Lord? The, the closer you walk with the Lord, the more naturally grace is going to flow good works out of you. Good works don't have anything to do with your salvation. They have everything to do with your life service unto God. And a lot of people don't understand that. And they try to mix the two and make salvation dependent upon your level of works. And it can't be done. Like you said, Brother Luke, it's like oil and water. They don't mix. And by the way, one of the things the Catholics say that make me crazy, one of the many, is that you must enter or earn a state of grace. Okay, if, if, if you must do any work to receive grace, it's not grace. It's debt. You're doing something and then saying, hey, God, give me something. Amen. Grace is unmerited. Grace. So it, 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 it clearly says that grace is no longer grace if there's any work. You, you, and if you're trusting in something you do, that means you're not trusting in what Christ already did. Mm -hmm. you're, it, it, you, you cannot mix them. It makes zero sense at all. I don't know how they do this convoluted mess. I, it yeah. gives me a headache when I hear some of the ways people rationalize these things. One guy said, you get, you confess the sin once you're saved and then you repent of that sin and then the blood is applied. It's not applied to that sin until you do that. I don't know what we do with the sins we don't know we commit. Wow. I, don't know what I loved it. I loved that. You're, you go like this. I feel like, like this, you ever see that movie this. Scanners? Did you guys see that movie Scanners back in the 80s? That crazy sci-fi movie? No, none of us watched it. Explodes. None of us yeah, watched I saw TV. it. Yeah, I th saw his it. head explodes. And that's how I feel sometimes. I feel like my head is going to explode because I, I don't know how else to say it. And then one day I got some peace when I saw, well, if the gospel's hid, it's hid to them that are lost. So they're not going to hear it. I can't do nothing. God's got to show them. You know? Yeah. So... But yeah, I feel like I'm going to lose it sometime. I really do. So uh, I feel that way whenever I hear Michael Brown. Mr. Lisa, uh, did, is it fair to say if someone starts talking about works and, and uh, um, that 
hey, don't you understand that grace means no works? You, I mean, oh, yeah, absolutely. I, had, well, I mean, well, Romans well, 4 or 5 couldn't yeah. be any clearer. Yeah. But to I him had, that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly. I mean, the word is right there. It actually says ungodly. His faith is counted for righteousness. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I, I did a, a verse by verse teaching on the book of Acts. And I had two uh, brothers um, helping me with it. It was a group discussion as we went through the book of Acts. We get to chapter 15, verse 1, and which says um, the men from uh, Judea came and, and said, you cannot be saved unless you're circumcised to Paul's disciples. And, uh, of course, that caused Paul and uh, uh, I guess Silas or was a Barnabas or Silas, but Paul, he went to Jerusalem for this Jerusalem council. But when we did the study, these two brothers were telling me and everybody listening that, uh, well, even though people believed in Jesus and also believed uh, circumcision was necessary, that they would still be saved. And I said, well, the more, um, modern times, is we don't get circumcised for salvation, but people would say, you need to get baptized for salvation. Are you saying that if a person believes that believe, they, they must believe in Jesus and they must also get baptized, that they that they would be saved. And they said, yeah, I, I really think that the, if someone doesn't understand it right and they believe that faith plus law, faith plus works, that God would still save them. I had to um, disassociate from those two brothers at that time. I could not... I could not um, uh, work with someone that was arguing that uh, faith and works of believers, uh, it's okay, it's acceptable. And so, uh, but then I went to these verses in Galatians that we're referring to where Paul says you can't mix grace and works. If, if you put them together, that's nullified. It's no effect. And uh, But I could never get through to them, unfortunately. Yeah, or Titus 3.5 not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, is, is anybody else want to say more on that last one? I've got another one here. I'll, I'll submit then. And... This is the title of one of my videos. Uh, um, uh, and that is, works never work. In other words, we already established earlier that, uh, that someone says, or Brother Dave says, well, okay, if works are necessary, we need to just show me the verse in the Bible that says exactly which works are needed and, and exactly to what degree of success is needed. And I said, well, the verse is that you have to be perfect. From your first breath to your last breath, and perfect is required. So that's the standard the person has to meet. So if that's true, then that's true that um, from Adam and Eve, through all the history of humanity, present time and off into the future, that um, works don't work today, works have never worked in the past, and works will never work in the future. Works never work to gain salvation through works. Well, I concur wholeheartedly, but uh, um, uh, uh, yeah, I, I concur. <laughs> Mm -hmm. okay. Well, I mean, you can't do enough works. You, the, the reason Christ died is because we were helpless. Our situation could not be remedied by us. God himself had to fix it. God had to fix it. Works don't work because we can never do enough of them and they never can be good enough. So it's got to be through the work of Jesus. 
And, and when he did that play on words, when they asked, what are the works we must do to inherit eternal life? It drives me crazy when people don't understand the rich young ruler, when Jesus is trying to show him that he hasn't kept them all since his youth and he needed a savior. And he lists all these works of the law that he needs for eternal life. And what he's trying to do is make him guilty by the law. And people take that and go, see, Jesus said you got to keep the commandment. Yeah, if, if you can, from birth till death perfectly. So, mm -hmm. you know, and, and Jesus answered, this is the work of God that you believe on he whom he sent. So any kind of works apart from simply believing on Christ, which isn't really a work, is the only way to be saved because only Jesus could do what he did. It, no human being can do enough works. There's nothing we can do because the wages of sin is death. And without the shedding of blood, there is no remission for sin. And only his blood was without sin. He was the only one that could fix this problem for us. So no works. If works could help at all or save us at all, Christ died for no reason. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Any more on that one? Or shall I post the next one? This one is one of my favorites. It was uh, originated by Brother Ronnie, who is known as Hood Minister <laughs> or St. Hood. Uh, and this is, we have a license to rest. Brother Dave, we have a license to rest. Okay. About, are you ready? Hey, Dave? Brother Luke, I got a question for you. What? How many works could a woodchuck work if a woodchuck could chuck works? <laughs> well, he has to do 100% of works all the time perfectly. I know that. That's about as much sense as trying to work for salvation makes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, do you see the next one, Dave? I posted it. It says, we have a license to rest. Uh, contrast that with the claim that we are teaching we have a license to sin. On the yeah. contrary, we have a license to rest. Brother Dave? Well, Amen. And, you know, um, Sister Lisa touched on this earlier. People that accuse, you know, believers in the person and finished work of Christ alone, they always throw out the, well, you just love your sin. You just want to live in sin. You just want to sin it up all you want and claim that you got a free ticket to heaven. And as Sister Lisa pointed out earlier, no child of God can comfortably continually live in wickedness and not and not be chastened of the Lord. The Bible says all children of God are partakers of his chastisement, which is his discipline or his uh, instruction. And it says, if you can be without such stuff, then you are a bastard, the Bible says. That means a fatherless child. And so God uses these things to instruct us. And, and like Lisa said, we don't know how far God lets us go. God let me go really far, uh, neck deep into certain things, before he pulled the pulled the plug on things and got me back in close to him. And so on the flip side of that, we have a license to rest in the person and finished works of Christ that we no longer have to strive and 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 uh, feel this burden or this weight to try to be right with God. We've been made right with God through his son. We have peace with God. And therefore we can learn to appreciate and and be grateful and love the Lord for what he's done for us and it and it propels us through our love and his grace to go and and serve him and do things, you know, that are pleasing to him. And and it's a it's a lifelong process for everyone. But we have we rest in who Christ is and what He completed for us, and that changes everything. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the hardest working saints I know is Brother Matthias. Uh, sometimes I think he's working too hard. I worry, and he, he needs to rest. Uh, so, Brother Matthias, uh, you do agree that we have a license to rest, right? Oh yeah, and uh, that's what I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Uh, you know, because um, people always think when we preach that we're giving the the license to, to sin, and we just love our sin, and and we um, uh, we're giving people, you know, a, a reason to just stay in sin. It's 
one, it just shows that they have an unregenerate mind. Um, but two, uh, you know, whenever they say, you know, you got to have good works, you got to keep working, you got to do all this. And uh, like you said, if um, if we have works that they can see, at the same time, we're preaching to them to rest and cease from their own works in order to go to heaven. And then they sit there and try to say, oh, well, you just don't want to work. Really? R really? Those of us who, uh, who are um, walking close to the Lord, that's what probably brings us the most joy is when we see that he's doing his work in and through us. So license to rest means that we get to not only rest from the work of, you know, mandation for salvation, but we also get to rest and sit back and watch God do his work in and through us. And that's an, a beautiful thing to see. Yeah. Amen. Uh, I want to ask Sister Paula uh, about this. Um, now, again, this particular phrase came about because of the accusation against Paul and against uh, us who uh, teach Paul's message that um, uh, we're teaching a, a license to sin. So Brother Ronnie says, no, we have a license to rest. Uh, how, can, you, can you relate that to uh, Mary and Martha uh, uh, situation with Jesus? Well, yeah, in that scenario, she uh, Mary was resting. She was not running around making preparations. And I, I think personally that uh, Martha was upset, not because she wasn't working, but because she it was scandalous for her to be a rabbinical student like that. But the, the point is, yeah, that she was she had the better choice. Jesus said that she made the better choice to sit and listen instead of trying to accomplish something. Um, but it keeps coming back to the relationship. You can't earn a gift and you can't work for a relationship in the, in the terms of trying to coerce or earn or merit something. A relationship doesn't work that way. And if we just get Christians to understand that relationship thing, that would solve a lot of these problems. They would all go away because that's not how relationships work. You know, you can't, speaking of work, you can't um, try to buy someone's affection. I think that's pretty much the difference between um, salvation by grace and salvation by works is one, you have to merit someone's love and you can't, that's not how real love is. Mm -hmm. Amen. Um, I think we ought to make this the last uh, one to comment because it's it's getting quite late back east. Uh, I know everybody wants to go and go because it's Friday night, but I know that some people may need to finish up. So uh, the license to rest, uh, uh, anybody else, Renee or, or Lisa or, or, or anybody who hasn't commented on this one? Yeah, Brother Luke, um, I was just thinking about Hebrews chapter 4. And it talks about how we need to labor to enter into his rest. Oh, yeah. and, and at first that might seem a little peculiar to say labor to enter into it. But when you see how much difficulty we have in just discussing this topic tonight about justification by faith versus works, it is a labor to enter into that rest because we have to do battle against the lies that are being propagated by the false church, as well as our own machinations, the devil shooting fiery darts, you know, to try to bring us down. But if you if you study that passage of scripture in Hebrews chapter four, it talks about uh, even what we were discussing tonight for unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. But the word preached and not profit them not being mixed with faith in them that heard it they they do not believe and if you don't have the belief in the tetelestai paid in full it is finished 
then you can't have the rest because you have to believe to get to that rest. And that's exactly what this passage is talking about as referring to the Hebrews of old regarding uh, their little journey in, in the wilderness and how they couldn't in, enter in because of unbelief. And that's the same thing now. You cannot enter into his rest if you do not believe his promise about that rest. Exactly. I wanted to add to that labor to enter into the rest. I like the play on words there about laboring and rest. It also says that uh, we have ceased from our own works as God did from his. That's the rest we have. We, we don't have to work. We, we are resting because we know that God's promise said that Christ did it for us. Amen. But that when he used the words labor into that rest, that was a, a play on words about, like he said, entering into the promised land. And so those people couldn't enter because of unbelief. It clearly says it, just as she said. So the only people that aren't resting or that at peace uh, and not working to enter into the kingdom are those that are trusting God and taking him at his word. We are believing, so we rest. We know it's done. So if you're still working or troubled, you're not believing. You haven't rested in Christ. You haven't come to the place where you, now that doesn't mean we, we're saved on two good works. We're people zealous of good works. Doesn't mean our work, we're not going to work. Of course we're going to work. We're going to work because we're, we're saved. But we're never going to think any of the work that we do is actually getting us saved or keeping us saved. Uh, so the rest is really important. If you're not at rest, if you're not at peace, Jesus said to, to take his yoke, his, his, it's easy, his burden's light, you know? So th that's, that's uh, salvation. It's, it's resting in God. He is my refuge. I'm under his wings. I, I'm in him. It's all him that's doing the work. You know, I used to uh, try to explain the rest we have in Christ like taking a plane ride. Like you get in the plane and Christ, Christ is the plane himself, but let's just say he's the pilot. I don't know how to fly the plane. I can't get myself there, but I trust that he's going to, cause he said he would. And no matter what I do on that plane, if I throw a temper tantrum or if I drink too much alcohol, I'm still getting there. My, my, my journey might not be very pleasant. They might have to handcuff me to the chair or something, you know, but I'm still getting there. So I've trusted my savior. He's taken me. He's not my co-pilot. He's the pilot. I don't, he doesn't help me drive. He's the one driving. So Amen. You have to yeah. know that he, his promises are true. And I, I fear the reason people are constantly in fear and working and changing the God is they simply just don't believe. Yeah. Awesome. That's a beautiful picture you painted there. I love that. I don't, I never heard that one before. Um, all right, uh, we have a license to rest. Uh, anybody want to say more on that before we make our final remarks? Oh, I wanted to say one other quick thing, Brother Luke. Mm -hmm. uh, last week, Paula V mentioned something about, uh, oh, I hope I didn't just lose my train of thought. Oh. Um, oh, I have to come back. Come back to me, Brother Luke. All right, you'll think of it in a minute, okay? Uh, all right, I had a great time tonight. Uh, so let's... We we're, we're about halfway through through this list of truisms. We made more progress because we stayed longer than I planned, So, but I'm happy we could all do it. Um, but uh, <clears throat> uh, it is my hope, uh, again, I'm only hoping, I'm not demanding that everybody adopt these sayings. So, there's a few of them that I've invented, I guess, and then there's a few of them that came, I meant most of them came from the congregation, I asked people, send us a truism, something that's profound and short to, to help us understand this uh, salvation. And, and uh, so you, you sent them to me, and now I'm saying, can we start beginning to use these in our everyday language so that they become commonplace? Because they, there is something profound about a, a very short statement 
that, that, is, that uh, says a powerful truth in only a few words. So I'm hoping that people will, will uh, learn the list and make it part of your vocabulary. Um, again, I'm hoping, I'm not telling you what you must do. Um, so let's, uh, let's uh, each take a minute now and give a little summary of your, your thoughts on, on the time we had together tonight, uh, starting with Sister Paula. I think um, everything had to do really with what is salvation itself. Is it a gift or not? And it can't be part gift, part wage. There's no such thing. It's one or the other. On you know what Jesus said in his parable of the wine skins, you can't put new wine in old wine skins. There's a clean, mutually exclusive break between the two, and we, anybody who's trying to mix them doesn't understand that. So it's a big deal. All those truisms point to that fact that this this is a relationship. It's a gift. You receive it, and that's all you can do. And whatever happens after that is because you did. And if it's not happening, maybe you didn't. I, th I think that's about as much as I could summarize it. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. Appreciate you being with us tonight, uh, Sister Paula. Uh, my brother Dave? Hey, Brother Luke, I'm here. I'm sorry. I was just in the middle of writing a comment. Yeah, excellent uh, fellowship tonight. Uh, so much great input from everybody tonight. It was a lot of good things said. It was really uh, positive, and it was uh, really uplifting. Uh couple new people in the chat that uh you know were helped a lot everybody in the chat was so gracious and so eager to help uh those coming in you know struggling with stuff and just to watch that happen is just you know is what this is all about really you know us uplifting and edifying one another and bearing each other's burdens and when we get you know new people to come in um you know and they're struggling but then by the time the end of the broadcast they're they're in a much better place and they you know, they're, they're willing to go and seek the word or seek the Lord. And that's, that's just a great thing to see. And that, that really, uh, made my night to see that. Yeah. And, uh, I, that, I think you could apply your comment, uh, also to yourself, uh, because you, you were having a difficult day and I'm sure that, uh, this fellowship together here was helpful to you uh, as it is to all of us. I, uh, <clears throat> so thank you for being with us, brother Dave. And, and absolutely sister sister lisa uh, i think we had 12 truisms and probably four of them i think actually originated from you uh, you never you never sent me one um, I, i've asked people hey make a comment email me send me a truism that you want you think we should promote you never sent me any but all of these that were uh, originated from you were from me listening to you over the years and things being profound. And I thought that is a profound way of stating it. And I've remembered them. So um, thank you. Uh, what are your thoughts on the time tonight? That was awesome. I had a wonderful time. Uh, thank you for that, Brother Luke. I guess I get an F on that homework because I didn't hear you say that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know where I was at the time, but I missed it. So I get it. No, actually, my dog ate my homework. Where would that get me? <laughs> okay. I remember what I wanted to say about um, Sister Paula V from last week. She said something. It was awesome. And, and that was that in the Bible, God has placed stumbling blocks for people. <laughs> and I know a lot of people might not understand that, but it is true. Uh, Jesus will reveal or show you who you are and see part of that is him trying to break up that fallow ground. If you have a heart that is hard, he'll put a stumbling block in your way to see, are you going to press forward and break through that thing? Or is that going to be what stops you much like he did with the rich young ruler? Okay. And uh, she pointed that out, and I was thinking about that when we were talking about entering into his rest and how people who will not simply believe the truth of the gospel, the plain, simple gospel, which is easy enough for a five-year-old to understand, he will allow that hardness in their heart to block them from entering in because they won't press forward and get rid of that pride, the unbelief, arrogance, uh, whatever it is that's standing in their way. 
because they will not look at the scripture simply as a little child and humble themselves and only believe. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. Uh, so Renee had an emergency to had to take her dog out. So she says good night to everybody. And uh, my brother Matthias, um, I, I had hey, to. Hey, Luke, sister, sister Renee's dog's got to go do some religious doo doo. <laughs> <laughs> okay, very good. You've been paying attention, huh? You're already in incorporating this into your everyday language. Awesome. Uh, uh, so, um, Matthias. Um, You've, uh, I, I was glad you were able to participate to, uh, tonight a little bit and give us your thoughts on the time tonight. Uh, very enjoyable. Makes the night go by quick listening to the insights of brethren. So I appreciate everybody on the panel. Um, I haven't really been able to pay attention to the chat, guys, so sorry about that. Um, uh, a little focused on a few things the broadcast particularly but uh i thought it was good to go over these I, I i know you've been talking about doing this for like you said six months or so so i'm glad we finally got to do part of it and i look forward to the next one all right thank you brother thank you for uh, making it possible and uh to the, uh, the chat room and the viewers uh, i guess the last thing i would ask of you is um I know you've been involved in participating and paying attention. So could you make a comment on this video tonight uh, after it's uploaded, make a comment. I'd like everybody to tell me what you think is your favorite or your favorites uh, of the, 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 I think the 12 or 13 uh, truisms that we discussed tonight. If you have, you know, one or two that are particularly uh, profound to you, uh, make a comment and let us, let me know. I'd love to hear back from you about that. So thank you everybody for participating. Uh, it's always a joy to uh, be with people who want to talk about Jesus and the Bible. So uh, join us also, uh, this is Friday, join us Sunday at 5 p.m. Eastern for the Church of the Eternally Secure Sunday service. Uh, thank you for being here tonight, everybody. Bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus. <laughs>